So before we go uh, live, is there anything you don't want to talk about or particularly do want to talk about? I don't want to talk about incest okay. and uh, that's That's Trump. my script. That's my script for <laughs> Incest and Trump. Hi, it's Rob Moore here and welcome to the Disruptive Entrepreneur Podcast. So we've come down to Cheltenham and I'm about to interview Dom Jolly. So he's very famous for Trigger Happy TV, pulling a lot of pranks and stunts. Hello! What? Now I'm in a restaurant! And we have just had the longest chat, rant, conversation, off on a million tangents, talking about all the different areas of his career and his life and his beliefs. I think this is probably one of the most unique interviews you will see. So let's go and watch the interview with Dom Jolly. Warning, the language is very <laughs> colourful. Cheers, Dom. Cheers. Thanks for giving up your time. I'm not giving it up. You're giving me a break from doing work, ah, which is great. Although thank you. this is work, technically. And this is like your office, really, here, I'd love to say this is my entire office. <laughs> yeah. But actually, this is the house that Superdry built. So we're in Cheltenham, which is my hometown. Yeah. And uh, this is 131 The Prom which was set up by Julian Dunkerton, who set up Superdry. All right. I mean, it's not quite as brilliant as it sounds, but supposedly he sounded, he started on a market stall, yeah. and now Superdry is this massive mm. thing. It's not quite that true, but it yeah. was a bit better than that. But yeah, so he's, he's built this, which is incredible. Like Normally when you come out of London, you're kind of thinking, I want to go to London, but actually this place is so nice. Mm. Um, I spend most of my time here. I've read my last three books here. So oh, just up in the yeah. restaurant, yeah. and you, you don't find the distractions a problem when you... I love that. Yeah. I mean, normally I've got headphones on and I'm listening, but I really like, uh, I like distractions when I'm writing. I like watching, people. it's a real people yeah. watching place, but I love that. Yeah, it's funny that, isn't it? Because I think some people, when they write books, they want to be completely isolated. I think people do it in completely different ways, yeah. but I'm really odd anyway. Like, I can't sleep if I don't have something on in the background. I have to have speech on. Mm. I'd like to say otherwise the voices come. It's not quite that bad, but it's... It's so I always have something on, and in my mind, I sort of wonder whether when I go to sleep, I kind of osmo stuff. I don't think so, yeah. but yeah, so, so I, I always need stuff going on, really. I'm not very good in a really quiet place, but I know some writers want to go and live in a little yeah. cabin in the woods and you know, nothing. Mm. So, is that um, like audio books and information you have on, or is that just storytelling, or is it what, music? At night? Yeah, uh, at night, it's always just a news, so it's LBC or Radio 4, or BBC and you just World leave Service. it on and go to sleep, yeah. I think it's because I grew up in Lebanon and like you always had world service on in the background. Right. That would be like, I just, I, I like having stuff on yeah. in the background. Yeah. So I've never told anyone this and I yeah. never thought this interview was going to go this way, but. Wow, it's um, early. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Where's it going? <laughs> Let me have some of that. Yeah, go on. So um, my mum and dad used to run pubs mm -hmm. and they'd put the telly on for me at night upstairs That's while the they're down. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at 12 o'clock, do you remember you got the sort of channel four where it went beep and yeah. there's a picture of a girl with some colors in the background. Yeah, of course, the and, classic, yeah, the, and, the and, test card. Exactly. And then after that, it just went that to- your friend? Well, yeah, that was my, um, yeah, that was my babysitter. Yeah, yeah. And then after that, it just, just, you know, all the interference white noise you get yeah, on yeah. TV. Oh, that's going to fuck you up. Now until 27 years old, I used to sleep with that on at night. Because they didn't come up and turn it off. Yeah, and it, it was really soothing for me. Oh, that's weird. Yeah, that's so good. like, like it was actually three years pretty much in therapy, not yeah, you know, yeah, coming yeah. off that. But like, if I had girlfriends and things, I'd have to go and put the telly on. Wait you, for know, them to you know, that's what they actually put on in Guantanamo. To yeah, fuck yeah. People up. And heavy metal, which I also <laughs> like. Yeah, that's so, right. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah, so yeah, I've just revealed something I probably shouldn't. But no, well, but that, no, but I can get that. How like? But that's good. That makes your brain work in a different way. Yeah, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. And it's it's like what you grew up with. You're you just unconsciously comfortable with. Yeah, I mean, I think I've got a very, I've got a very, I'm actually very lazy, but I've got a very active mind, like a fast mind. And that doesn't mean I'm smart. It just means that I'm always like thinking about yeah. stuff. And I think in a way that can be really good and really bad. Mm. You know, like I think sometimes it allows you to come up with great ideas, but sometimes you get swamped with stuff. Yeah. And I think I always need things going on. And I don't think that's a great thing. I'd love just to be able to, I just went to India actually, uh, for a long reason that I won't be bothered to talk about and went to my idea of hell which is doing sort of nothing like a, yeah, an ashram. Yeah. And yeah. it was like, you weren't allowed phones and you're supposed to, the restaurant had no silence and stuff. Mm. And literally I nearly, I nearly died. Yeah. <laughs> it was just like, yeah. I couldn't do it. Yeah, it's funny. I need stuff going on. Yeah. I'm exactly the same. Yeah. I didn't, I thought I was the only weird one. Well, I think a lot of people, I don't like holidays. I don't like no, not seeing and getting tanned. No. Well, that's my whole, I mean, I wrote a book called the dark tourist, which is all about when I go on holiday, I just, I mean, relaxing on holidays. I can't do that. Yeah. I need to have something to do. 
That's why my idea of a good holiday is go to North Korea or go to Chernobyl for the weekend. It's like, that is, yeah. I, I need something to do. So yeah. yeah. And so you like exploring and things like I that. I just, yeah, like, I'm just interested in stuff, basically, mm. yeah. I'd love to be able to relax. Yeah. Like, all I want to do is just chill and do, lie on a beach, but I just, mm. I'd go mental, I think. Mm. And do you think that's one of the reasons why you write so many books? You've done six, have you? Or you're doing your sixth? I'm on my sixth now. Well, actually, that's a very lazy. I mean, I'm 50, so that's not that many, but I only started writing books. I mean, I do lots of different things. That's yeah. my problem. I've, I've actually... So I'm a jack of... You know, it's like, uh, I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. Mm. And that really is like what sums me up. Like when I grew up, I remember my dad telling me that he was really disappointed because I left a job when I was like 23 or whatever. Yeah. And he said, oh, you know, you can probably leave a job once, but that's it. Like after that, you'll never get a proper job. And he came from that generation where you had well, a he job was, for he life. He was speaking his truth. Yeah, yeah. It's just a different world. Yeah, of course. Yeah. And that was like when you just had a job for life and you stuck at it. Mm. And I remember reading a thing ages ago thinking that people that were going to survive in the future were the people that would be able to change jobs every yes. six months yeah. and do it. And that mm. is kind of true now. That's what happens. But I've never really found a job that I like, but I found lots of different things I like doing. Mm. So part of me wishes I'd just committed to something. But on the other hand, I love like doing different things all the time. Yeah. Since Trigger Happy happened, it's opened up. I never know... Part of me worries all the time. I don't know what I'm going to do next year. I don't know I'm going to earn my money. I haven't got a pension. But then also I think I love that. I've no idea what I'm going to do. Like mm. literally, if you'd told me this time last year what I'd be doing, I'd, I'd just say you're mental. I just spent New Year's Eve in fishnets on stage in Brighton <laughs> playing the narrator in the Rocky Horror, which is mm. like in a musical, like everything about me, an ex-goth, I can't dance. Like is that's my idea of hell, but it was mm. brilliant. So I love that. Yeah. So there's that paradox between you love the variety, but you also fear not having the stability and the security. It's exactly that, which mm. I think is what happens to most people. You, you make that trade off. You know, I remember when I we was doing Trigger Happy, we used to be doing a late shoot and we'd go over the bridge and you'd see everyone coming over a bridge in London to work. And you'd think, oh, look at us. We're crazy. Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. we're not you're going to work. You're all sheep. And yeah. then I think, well, actually, it'd be quite nice to know yeah. that you've got nine to five and you've got a proper. But it would bore me as well. Mm. So when I do have something that's stable, I get really bored. But then when I don't have it, I get really worried because I've got to look after my kids and stuff. Yeah. But it's all grumbles. I mean, like, yeah. it's great. Basically, since I was 30, I've never woken up once and thought I don't want to go to work. Although, you know, like, I've always loved what gift. I wanted. That's all you want, isn't yeah. it? If you can earn your living doing what you love. Yeah. Because I remember, again, my dad used to say, you used to earn your money so that you can go off on holiday or mm. do stuff. And I used to think, but you spend all your time at work. Like, I want my well, work, work to, to be... a holiday. Yeah, yeah I'm a, well, mm. not a holiday. Well, it is a holiday, but mm. I want my work to be what I like. But yeah. that's a very rare thing that's only happened with your generation my generation like before that wasn't an option really mm. unless you were just loaded anyway yeah and then you just went on heroin yeah <laughs> <laughs> so um how do you then make that transition from one career to another how do you decide to go and do rocky horror how do you decide decide to you know a bit of fun politics a bit of journalism a bit of writing a bit of radio because in podcasts that you I think do it's, i think it's part of my problem is that i don't say no i kind of I feel I'd like a go at everything. Because how do you know that you're good at something unless you do it? Mm. And the problem is that having had no offers, like the moment you something like Trigger Happy happens, it opens so many doors. And so, for instance, I was offered to write for an, a newspaper. Now, I know that I was offered to write for the indie because I was Dom Jolly yeah. from Trigger Happy, but I also know that I wouldn't have written for them for 15 years if I couldn't write. Yeah. So that was all right. That, I, that was something I could do. But then I've said yes to loads of things and just thought what am I doing I'm terrible mm. at this so sometimes you do like say yes you need to really if you're really good you decide you'll sort of fix that it but my problem is that I suddenly think oh I've run out of money someone offers me something I think right I'll do that mm. and sometimes it's terrible but it pays well yeah and sometimes the thing you're really good at doesn't pay well and it's not fine if you're on your own but if you've got kids and a wife sometimes you've got to do terrible things sure bitch got to pay rent as yeah Kate Moran once said. <laughs> yeah yeah i think a lot of people see the commercial side as dark and evil and all that Fuck but that it's shit. not I is mean, it well it is i mean you know like bill hicks i don't like stand-ups like i'm not into comedy particularly but bill hicks basically said you know if you do anything for money you're sucking the devil's cock. That right. was his, yeah. his, his stance. And he's quite so right. How do we survive then in a capitalist society? If but you... it's not that, but I've never set, you know, like, so when I did Trigger Happy and then I did an ad, someone goes, oh man, you've sold out. I go, well, probably sold out, but I never set myself up as someone that was like that anyway. So a good example of that is John Lydon from Sex Pistols. You know, that Sex Pistols were all punk and all that mm. stuff. So for him, it is difficult starting to see him doing a butter ad, you know, and you're yeah. like, and, and he's like, I didn't sell out. I go, well, yeah, but you did set yourself up as punky. I never set myself up as that. I just want to 
I want to have a good time all the time in the yeah. words of Nigel Tufnell. So, mm. yeah. And is there an argument, actually, that um, good art and good creativity is where you're able to do what you do, love what you do, and make a living doing what you do? See, that's a really interesting thing, because I think good art comes from hunger. Uh, because, for instance, the, the taking money, I don't give a shit about. Like, if you look at old masters, like old painters, for mm. instance, they would all be paid by a, a, a mentor or whatever to pay, you know, paint some portrait of whoever for a vast amount of money. And that would pay for them to then do the stuff they want to do. Yeah. For me, I look at money, like if I take an ad or something like that, that pays my bills so that I can actually do the stuff I want to do. Yeah. Because if I'm having to do the stuff I want to do and pay the bills, unfortunately it doesn't because what mm. I want to do is quite odd and it doesn't pay the bills. Yeah. But I also think that if you get too much money or you're getting just used to that money, you lose your hunger, you get lazy. I certainly suffer from that. I had 10 years where I made a lot of money and I just did fuck all. I just, mm. why did I need to? And I just did the occasional reality show and I went traveling and I've had a brilliant life. Yeah. But I did shit work. Mm. And then suddenly some money ran out and it made me hungry again. And it made me think, you know what? You got to really think about this. Are you just going to take money to do stuff you don't particularly like, but just to carry on? Or what are you going to do? Like, I'm getting to 50. So anything, I want to do stuff I really want to do. Mm. So I think hunger is a really important thing. I think poverty is really important. Yeah. It's all relative poverty, but. I think that's what really makes you do great stuff. Mm. Could you also create that where it's maybe not necessarily hunger in a financial sense, but it's hunger in a need, a desire, a motivation sense, or a wanting to be known or a wanting to do great work? I th yeah, I think it's the great work thing. I mean, I'm really, I'm in a really odd situation because I'm, I happen to be really good at the, at the least respected part of comedy. The hidden camera, which is what, you know, pranking or, mm. I hate that word pranking, but, Trigger Happy essentially is a hidden camera show. Yeah. Now, but when I grew up, hidden camera was, well, it had candid camera, which you could argue was the inventor of reality TV and actually was very surreal early on, but then became very lazy in golf jokes. And then I grew up with things like Beatles About, which you're probably too young to remember. I remember, yeah. All that kind of stuff. And hidden camera was just shit. I mean, it really was. And even things like Jackass, it was, it was, Jackass came after Trigger, but it, it was just basically loud people doing stupid stuff. And... I know most people who haven't seen Trigger Happy think it's all about me shouting into a phone. Mm. And I kind of like that and the phone thing was okay, but I put it before the credits because that was not what Trigger Happy was about. To me, it was about doing hidden cameras and art form. It's ad-libbing, it's, it's improv, which is a terrible word. I hate improv because it makes you think you're John Sessions stuck in a lift or, you know, it's not. But if you look at all the great shows in America, like Curb Enthusiasm, great films like Spinal Tap, those are all improv. Those are all things where you start with a very limited no script and then just riff off it. Mm. Here, there's nothing you can do with it. Mm. But I'm really good at doing things like Trigger Happy, but it's not respected. So it is odd when you think about, do you want to be well known? I kind of gave up after a bit because Trigger Happy, I thought was brilliant. And I put all my life into it, like two, three years, everything about it. I edited it, chose all the music, did everything. Mm. And people are like, who wrote it? Or, and I'm like, what do you mean who wrote it? Like, <laughs> A, no one wrote it, but B, how do you think I can write something where I'm about to bump into someone in the street? Because, so I don't think people appreciate it. And I thought, oh, fuck this. I'll just go and have a good time. And then mm. actually now I've come back to think, do you know what? Trigger Happy kicked off a whole lot of hidden camera shows that were shit. Mm. And most of them were faked. That's what really irritated me because you have to fake a lot if you've got a limited time to yeah. make it done. And so now I'm coming back to thinking, you know what? It's been 20 years basically since Trigger Happy started. Hidden camera is the biggest comedy form in the world. If you look at all those clips you see online on Facebook mm. on, and, and you kind of, a lot of them, you don't even know who's done them. There's something from Russia, there's something from Brazil and no one's claimed that and said, this is where, if you want to be the hidden camera guy, this is where you're going to be. So I've set up a company called Shady Cabal and that's the idea I'm going to do is kind of go, well, you know what? No one's grabbed this format. So I'm going to say, this is where you come and do it. Yeah. And that's what I'm going to try and do. So almost like a renaissance of your art form. I think so. I, yeah. I just, you see, I never thought of it as an art form. It's something I'm just born with that I can do and no one else treats it as an art form. But mm. actually, it's such a big thing. It annoys me that people don't, it, it's, it's often done so badly yeah. or it's faked or it's just shit mm. and lowest hanging fruit. But when it's done really well, it's a really difficult, clever thing to do. Mm. And uh, I kind of want people to appreciate that, not necessarily for my stuff, yeah. but just for the really good stuff. I want people to see the difference between that. Mm. So a couple of things would be good to talk about in there. So the first thing is you said, great art, there needs to be some kind of hunger. So yeah. did, what was your hunger that created Trigger? Um, 
it wasn't a hunger. It was total luck that created t- Trigger. I was, I was doing a serious job. I was working at ITN. I was a political producer. I was being sent out to do the sort of junior interviews. I'd go out on the college green, you know, in front of Big Ben and get interviews of people. And it was so boring. I know I was watching this shit. So I thought, well, I'll just get people to do stuff in the background. It was just for my enjoyment, really. So yeah. I'd get friends. So we did Paddy Ashdown. And I got some friends to dress up as clowns and have a fight in the background. Mm. And ITN saw this and they were like, this is amazing. Yeah. Like, while the, we're having this boring chat with Paddy Ashdown, there's clowns fighting. So they put that up. And then I had David Meller on, who was Secretary of State for Culture or whatever. Mm. And we are talking about football hooliganism. And I got some friends to play football in the background. And they kicked a football and it smacked him right in the face. So again, everyone loved that. And so suddenly, like, all these stories started kicking off. And they realized that I was setting them up. So that I was fired from ITN. Yeah. And I thought, well, I really, I much more enjoyed doing that sort of stuff than serious stuff. So I started doing my own thing and that's what it was. It was really just, how can I earn a living doing things that doesn't feel like earning a living? Mm. Like, I just want to have fun. I get a real kick out of doing odd stuff and stirring stuff up, not in a political way, just in a really pathetic way. Mm. The Trigger Happy was just came from, I don't know, just someone paid me to do what yeah. comes naturally, really. Mm. Like, we all get pissed in a pub, most of us, and have an idea. And I'm sure everyone hasn't had the idea right, tomorrow I'm going to dress as a snail and crawl really slowly across the road and see if things stop. But you have an idea, you think, oh, wouldn't that be funny? And you all have a laugh and you forget about it. Suddenly I was in a situation where I would suddenly have this idea and I could ring someone up and the next morning, well, not next morning, but a week later, there'd be a snail costume and we'd go and do it. Yeah. So I, I guess you just perpetuate that. You make mm. your own, you know, reality. Yeah. I am. Whatever so, that means. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So something I love to try and do is, is work out what people have done that's worked for them or... Um, something that they've done that can inspire others. And, you know, you mentioned I was just born with it and now to do it prank, prank yeah. type stuff. You know, it was just luck. But I'm not sure it is. Uh, it's half luck, half not. Yeah. So when I say I'm born with it, uh, for me, so this is so odd. So people, from, people assume from what they know of me that I could just go and do a best man speech, for instance. That's my idea. Total hell. Like standing yeah. up as Dom Jolly doing that I'm honestly I hate doing that sort of thing mm. but I find it really easy to get in a snail suit and crawl slowly across a, a, a street for instance and people staring at you and everyone goes oh I don't know how you could do it and mm. I go be- because if it was just if I did that for no reason at all I'd be a mental patient like if I just decided <laughs> to dress up as a snail and crawl across Cheltenham mm. you'd be mental mm. but even though it looks to other people like I'm mental I know I'm doing it because there's a higher purpose that I'm filming it and it's going to be really funny. That's absolutely yeah. fine. So I always thought, well, I don't find that very difficult to do. Yeah. So I didn't see it as a skill or a talent. But then I realized that some people just wouldn't want to do that. Yeah. So I realized that it's not a talent, but it's like something I do particularly like to do. Yeah. But I think the most important thing about making your life is it is luck, but you've got to pounce on that luck. Yeah. Like you get moments, like most of us don't really know what we want to do or where we're going. But occasionally, you've got yourself by chance into a situation where that lucky moment, say you meet someone and you think, oh, it could work. But that's the moment where you've got to make your luck. Yeah. Like you just get given those certain moments and you've got to pounce on it. So it is a combination of luck. But also then thinking, I think more importantly, it's like knowing what you want to do. The people mm. I'm really jealous of are the people who at 16 thought that yeah, is I, what I, yeah, that's yeah. what I want to do. And I'm going to dedicate my life to doing it. And I bet they're jealous of you and the freedom and well, the autonomy. And- I mean, in the same field that I'm in, Sasha Baron Cohen's a great example. Now, I knew Sasha. We both started off at uh, Paramount mm. Comedy Channel together. Sasha, even at Cambridge, knew what he wanted to do, knew that comedy was what he wanted to do. I never knew I wanted to do comedy. Yeah. I, I was like, I wanted to be a writer. I wanted to be a foreign correspondent. I wanted to, I did all this stuff, fell into Trigger Happy and then, Oh, it was like, it was big. But then I was like, oh, do I want to do that? Sasha was like, right, this is what I want to do. Mm. I did that. The moment it becomes big, move to America. I got offered to go to America to do a trigger happy. I was like, oh, I don't know, you know. And he's single-minded about mm. it. Now, part of me thinks, I love the fact that I've had this weird life. But there's another part of me thinking, I wish I'd just dedicated everything I've done since I was 16 to one art form. But, but you can't, you know, it's up to you. You don't know yeah. whether it's right or wrong. No. But make, you got to make, you got to know when to make your luck. Yeah. That's the point. Mm. No one's lucky. You're lucky to an extent, but you've got to act on that as well. Yeah, yeah I you agree. You must know that. I mean, yeah, no, yeah. I, I completely agree. And I, you can probably spot moments where 
if you hadn't done something, it could have completely gone the other way. Yeah. It's that sliding doors thing. Yeah. There's about six moments where I think, fuck, if I hadn't got into that room on that day, I don't know what else would have happened, yeah. but it would have, it's very weird. Mm. And that's very difficult to give people as advice because of course you don't know, do you? No, you don't. I think what you can do is keep looking yeah. without losing your enthusiasm or desire. And cause some people just give up, don't they? That's terrible. Yeah. yeah the but then you give up, you don't give up because you lose your desire. You just give up because of reality. Like it's fine to pursue whatever it is you want to do when you're 25 and you've got no kids and mm. a wife, you can do what you want. Yeah. But then suddenly if you've got, responsibilities like i used to look at bands and think how can a band like how can some singer make this amazing album and then fucking make shit mm. and then you realize that well, if you dedicate your entire life to something it's gonna be good yeah. but then say you get married you have two kids yeah you're sitting on planes all the time or whatever yeah but you... then suddenly your life you can't dedicate yourself to it yeah your life starts to become more complicated than that so the weird thing about getting to 50 now which i am mm. is i think i've come out of that in a funny way and now you can your kids, you know, my girl was upstairs, she's 18. Yeah. yeah. And I suddenly think, oh, now I can start to come back to think, right, what do I really want to work at? Mm. It is tricky. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think as well as keeping looking for yeah. the opportunities, I think when you get one, you've got to double down on it. And I think and you've got go to go for it. Yeah. But again, that's really difficult, isn't it? Because people sort of say there's that terrible moment on things like Dragon's Den where these horrible fucking multimillionaires just sit there teasing, you know, people with dreams and say things like, if I invested in you now, would you give up your job tomorrow? And you're like, fuck you, no. Mm, yeah. Like, and they're like, well, if you're not, if you're not committed to it, how can you do it? And it's like, but that's easy for you to say, because mm. you've got 50 million quid in the bank, but yeah. people have got to pay stuff. So it is a really tricky thing to do, but I think you have to go with your gut. Mm. Yeah, I, um, I think I agree with you to a certain degree. At the same time, I guess you wouldn't want anyone, I, I certainly wouldn't want anyone to give up on whatever their dreams are. No, and not I at all. I wouldn't ever, ever want anyone to think, okay, well, my life's difficult, my, the realities of having kids, so I'm just going to, like, kick the can down the road, or I'm not oh, going to issue next year. Oh, I'm not saying that at all, but I'm just saying that's why, you know, obviously the solution when you're really wanting to go for something is to put everything into one thing. Yeah. But I'm just saying that's why sometimes people don't do it. Yeah. Because it's not just about them. No, it's, it's about. Not. A wife who probably doesn't share your dream of, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. you being whatever it is. And, and that's a really difficult thing to do. Mm. I still think you should do it. Yeah. But that's why people don't. And I mm. totally understand that. Yeah. I mean, often when you're quite comfortable and you've got a lot to lose, it's harder to take the of risk, course it isn't is, it? Which is why a lot of things happen when you're younger. When yeah. you, it's just you and you're cocksure and you, yeah. you haven't, like, fucked up. Mm. But that's why it's much more fun when you're older because it's like, go for it. You yeah, know? you've got, like, a second go, but with more experience. And but the experience, like, yeah. you know, I had so many moments where I was like, fuck, if I just <laughs> go through that again and I knew what I knew then, I'd love to have another go at it. And yeah. actually, weirdly, I, I am having another go at it now. And it's just as difficult mm. and you're going to make difficult, different decisions. But it is really nice to have learned something and know something about it. But I'm learning about something that I didn't really know was a skill anyway. I mm. mean, it's really odd. Mm. So there's something else you said. I'm trying to pick out all these yeah. little gems. Is Sorry, I'm just renting. No, no, it's yeah. great. It's great. Just wait so, until I get out my second glass of wine. Really <laughs> I'm weird. waiting until I start question one. Have you not? Have you not? Have you not? Come on, ask some questions. Um, so, because I do think, like... It, it, in the American entrepreneur scene, yeah. there's a lot of big influencers saying, you know, 10x, hustle, work 20 hours a day, lunches for losers. And I, I, I don't yeah. like a lot of that I because that that's fine if you're 19 and you're living with your mum and yeah, you've got yeah, yeah. no rent and, you know, all that. You've got to be practical. Yeah, but that's if, you're, helping me, if yeah. you're 43 with two kids or if you're 60 and you're looking in your next and career. And you've got a great idea, but you think, oh, but that's going to take me my whole life. Yeah. 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 So I think I agree with you in that you know, not everything is, is as easy as just working hard. But I want to part that because there is some smart thinking I think someone can do. The 10,000 hours thing, I think, is important. You, mm. know, you know that yeah, thing, yeah? yeah. Mm. I think that's true. But again, the 10,000 hours thing only comes when you get to a certain age because mm. you've got to get there. Mm. I think once you've dedicated 10,000 hours to something, you're probably fucking good at yeah, it. Yeah. But how do you do that when you can't dedicate 10,000 hours? Mm. Yes. So I'm like the practical... Uh, entrepreneur. Yeah. I'm like, I'm the reasonable yeah, entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah. I'm the realistic entrepreneur. Yeah. <laughs> it's horrible. <laughs> yeah, but, but these things should be talked about of because course. there is a lot of hype, rah, rah, what, whatever. But one thing you did say, which I think is great, a great question to ask is, you, and you said, I think in these words, how can I have fun 
and make a living out of it? Yeah. Surely that's the question we should keep asking ourselves. Because if you keep asking yourself that and you keep searching and OK, you've got to do some ads and get a job. And, you know, what was it? The, um, the Bill Hicks what the quote of oh, something you, of the devil? Well, if you do anything for the money, you're sucking the devil's yeah, yeah. cock. Okay, yeah. so true. yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't necessarily agree with that. No, um, no, because I think you can turn your passion into your profession, like you, you have, and you got to finance it. Yeah. yeah, but sometimes it's okay to do something you don't love to fund something you of do. Course. Yeah, but if you keep asking, how can I have fun doing something I love and make a living out of it? Surely that's a decent quest for us to all have. I think it is, because to me, the only truth I know is that whether it's because I'm lazy or because I'm, I don't know, is that I'm really good at things that I really love. Yeah. And, and if I'm not, if I don't really love it, I'm not really good at it, but I'm doing it maybe for the money or whatever. Mm. Now, that comes back to my dad's sort of theory of like, well, you're lucky if you can get a job you like. Like, you just have to get a job. Yeah. You have to work. And I'm like, I think things have changed now. Mm. Like... And, it, and it's about, and that's why I'm really jealous of the early you can find what you like. Yeah. It's great. If you know what you want to do, that's great. I had no idea what I wanted no. to do until I was 30. Mm. And even then I fell into Trigger Happy and I was like, well, actually, do I really want to be hidden camera? Because look, I'm 50 now. Do I really want to be dressing as a squirrel? Yeah. It's not a great look. You know, like you've got mm. to think of something mm. else. So it's about finding what it is yeah. you like and you're good at. And then thinking, well, what's the best way that I can make that into something that I can live with and really mm. do well with. Mm. But I don't know what the answer to that is. No, I mean, I guess everyone's got their own answer, yeah. haven't they? But I guess it doesn't matter whether you're 50 and 60 going into a new career or you're 18 or you're 35, I think you've got to keep asking. Yeah. Um, because I, I didn't find what I wanted to do till I was, what, 25, 26? I, I didn't even ask the question from the age 15 to 26, just chased women and got drunk. Um, when well, I that's was, what I want to do, but I'm, I'm yeah, yeah. How do you make money? Yeah. Out of that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. that might be a concept yeah. for a show. Yeah. Um, cool. So we're out to jump in and yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, look, this is just a chat anyway. But this is great. Um, proper questions. There. One thing I did kind of want to get into is how does one get into doing pranks for a living? Okay, I hate pranks. I, I know you hate that word, that word but word. like, how do you get into it? Well, what, what's, your, what's your word for pranks that's better? Hidden well, camera. I don't, I, I don't, but I call it hidden camera. Yeah. Pranks to me are just uh, whatever. But yeah. I'm, I'm just being snobby about it. Mm. Um, well, now it's really easy. I mean, when I started, like if... How did you get into it? Well, I got into it because I was really lucky. Literally, almost the year that I realised that that's the sort of thing I like doing, technology changed so that a year before, I would have had to hire a professional cameraman, a sound man, and then I'd have to pay them vast amounts of money to follow me around to do something mm. that was very unstructured. And I'd be a bit embarrassed because they'd be older, you know. And then suddenly, when I, it happened to me, it was a bit like punk. It, it, to me, it was the equivalent of suddenly people could buy a guitar for 100 quid, mm. go in their garage and just, you go, fuck, I don't have to be Richard Clayderman. I can just play. And, yeah. and it, it freed us up. And we bought a camera. Mm. It was a Sony, I don't know what it was, but it, it was a first three chip camera you could buy for a grand. And we bought that camera, me and Sam, and that's what we made all of Trigger Happy on now. Mm. Looking back, it was terrible, but it gave you the freedom to go and experiment. So, totally forgotten your question. No, just had, how does one get into it? How yeah, did you so get now, into it? So I'd say at those days, it was really difficult. And that mm. allowed me, like if I'd have gone in and tried to do it, they'd have said, who the fuck are you, piss off. Yeah. But we just filmed and filmed and filmed. And in the end, we had something they couldn't refuse because it was clearly funny. Yeah. Now, I think it's a lot easier because you've got YouTube. And now, if, if I was doing it, I'd just make my own stuff on one of these cameras yeah. and I'd put it on YouTube and I'd learn. And then basically the market speaks for itself. Like if you yeah. put it up on YouTube and you start getting loads of hits, you're a fucking hit. Mm. So I don't think that, I don't think you even need to ask that question. I don't think there's anyone out there saying, hmm, how can I make pranks? I mean, that's all people do on the mm. fucking internet. Mm. What I would say is how do I make good pranks mm. how do i make stuff that's actually interesting so, because, so if that's a better question yes can you, can you answer it how <laughs> yeah. do you make good well i think your... you do that if you've got a brain because i think i think comedy's weird i think there is a snobbery in comedy and people think if i've got a certain amount of brain if i've got a certain iq then i must do script and i must like do sitcoms and stuff mm. whereas i think it's kind of for exhibitionists who do pranks and do hidden camera stuff and i'm like if you're a smart person out there, don't think I've got to write a sitcom because sitcoms to me are, are a dead format anyway. Telly's dead. Like, telly's not 
going to exist in five, six years' time. Mm. The idea that you go and just watch whatever someone's chosen on Channel 4, that's, that's already pretty yeah. much dead. It's all going to be like a big iPlay. You just need to produce the content yeah. and sell it to someone. And you don't even need, in my day, I had to get someone to pay me. I had to get someone to pay to allow me to make it. Now mm. the cameras are good enough. If you've got good enough ideas, you've got to do it over and over again. So I would say what you need to do is, is get your own filter. Yeah. So you need to make so much of this stuff that you're aware what's crap. Because I've made so much shit. When we were doing Trigger Happy the first two years, mm. we just filmed and filmed and filmed, and so much of the stuff was crap. How did you work out what was good and what was crap? You just knew. There's a big difficulty when you're making pranks, and I'm going to use the word because you do, <laughs> is that it's an adrenaline rush. Yeah. Right? There is a real adrenaline rush about doing something. It's a bit like being a bank robber. There were moments when you so, you've set something up, and you look down the street, and Sam and I used to look at each other, who I made Trigger Happy with, and we used to think, this is such a rush. Like yeah. This whole street is all going on. And no one knows, but we know we're about to do something pathetic <laughs> that's going to change the whole street. And it yeah. kind of gave you a bit of a God symptom. You were like, oh, I love this. Yeah. So, and, and then when you do something and you go in and it's funny, like the rush is amazing. And you think, oh my God, that's so brilliant. That's so great. But the real test is you take it back and you just watch it in an edit suite or you watch it on your telly at home yeah. with people that weren't there. Mm-hmm. And without that adrenaline rush, is it funny still? Yeah. And I think... That's what I learned after a bit was, okay, I'd always get the rush because it's a real adrenaline rush. But also you're thinking, okay, is this genuinely good? Because sometimes I'd do something and it was like, right, that's it. Great. Let's fuck off. Yeah. And, and sometimes you need to think, okay, that was great, but we can do it better. Yeah. And it's difficult because you get that adrenaline burn and you get a crash and mm. stuff. So self-editing is really important. Yeah. Doing lots of it. Just, it's again, it's the 10,000 hour thing. Yeah. Because Sam and I just filmed and filmed and filmed. I don't know if we did 10,000 hours, but it felt like it. Mm. And you just got to know what's good and know what works. And then even things like pranks are a bit like, uh, like a great standout. I used to, you know, one of the things you look at with standout, like Eddie Izzard, you think, oh my God, it's amazing. He just, he's starting on something and then he just riffs. Mm. And that's so amazing. And then after a bit, you realize, these aren't fucking riffs. No, this is a model. He knows exactly what he's doing. But the skill is to make the riff look like it's yeah it's like he's just thought of it mm. and that's what i never understood so i used to go on shows like have i got news for you and stuff and think i'm not doing any research i need to riff this yeah. and then you think none you of these material. fuckers are riffing yeah. it so if you're a stand-up whether you've tried it or not you just over the time you know that you have certain things that if you get in trouble you can just go to that emergency yeah. riff and it's about learning that sort of stuff and that makes you better when you're improving and and doing pranking and stuff mm. so it sounds to me like just, just get out there and yeah, do it. Get out just there and do it. Just film the shit yeah, out of it. Quality. Sorry, quantity, not just... Oh, it's all yeah. about quantity at the beginning. Yeah. Because you'll work out... Because, again, you'll start off copying what you've seen. Mm. And that, what's the point? Yeah. That's like being in a cover band. Who gives yeah. a fuck if mm. you can play... You know, what someone else played. If you can play yeah. Nirvana, better Nirvana. You're not Nirvana. No. So fuck it. Just yeah. find your own voice. That's the yeah. most important thing. So keep doing stuff. Find what makes you laugh. And then the most important thing is when people go, that's not funny. I fucking hate that. Yeah. Comedy is subjective. Yeah. Like, so I don't care if you don't find it funny. I don't, there are lots of things I don't find funny, but I've seen people nearly die laughing watching. Yeah. So you have to trust your own instincts. Mm. If you start to think, what's the thing that will appear, if you start to yeah. get all demographic on mm. it, you're fucked. Yeah. You can only think, I've got to do what makes me and maybe the person you're doing laugh. Yeah. And you've got to just trust that other people won't find it funny. Mm. But if you're trying to second guess, you're fucked anyway. Sure. Is there a certain amount? Because it said you said when you've done it and you're editing it, you know, you get other people to watch it. Can there be a certain amount of myopia or delusion where you think it's hilarious, but no one else does? Have you got to be careful that? doesn't with that? matter because the worst thing you can do is have comedy by committee because, right. yeah. I mean, that's in fact what I'm with Trigger Happy. Trigger Happy, no one knew who the fuck we were. Yeah. We were totally left alone. We made it totally as we wanted to. Right. It was perfect. Yeah. Now, whether you like it or not, it was what we wanted. Yeah. The worst thing is then when after Trigger Happy and we were a hit, we went to the BBC, me and Sam, and suddenly all these people turned out of nowhere and you're kind of trying to play the game yeah. and you find people going, change that, change that. And you end up with seven different people's idea of what's funny mm. and nothing. It's like whoever designed the fucking interior of the Eurostar, yeah? yeah? They were like, we need something that appeals to everyone. They end up mm. with a grey and yellow interior. Yeah. It's like, what is that? I mm. prefer something, it, it needs to be your voice, mm. basically. So don't listen, be a cunt. I mean, that is actually a massively important <laughs> yes. thing. Should when we, people say, be the quote for well, the... Um... Please, be a cunt. Because <laughs> when, when people say, often, sometimes people are cunts, and, and they are horrible. Yeah. And to me, if you're a cunt in show business, it's the way you treat people who are not important to you, like the people behind the camera or on the way up. And there are people like that. 
But when people say someone's difficult or people are like perfectionists, it's like that's because if they're not, no one else is going to mm. fucking be. I took my foot off the pedal with a couple of things and suddenly like just morons who have no idea what we're doing did mm. it for their reasons. So yeah. you have to be a cunt right. sometimes to, to get what you how, want. How but that doesn't mean you treat people like a no, cunt. No, of course. That's the difference. Sorry to be okay. cunt. No, no. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so how does one define that word when you're saying be one of those? How... Be a monster sometimes. Yeah. Like I, I think. Do you mean? Do you it, mean obsessive about your art and yeah, the outcome yeah, that you yeah. want? Yeah. Keep a com- diva to- or make being. Do you know what diva is a great word? So here's the great example. What's the classic example of like show business diva behaviour? It is uh, um, Van R- Van Halen supposedly on their tour rider, you know, you have a rider yeah, yeah, yeah. and they asked that there'd be no blue M&Ms yeah. in their That's bowl the of M&Ms. It's the famous yeah, 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 one. Yeah, yeah. But do you know why that is? Why? It's the most brilliant story. Yeah. So these, they basically would give a full rider for where they're going. They don't yeah. know where the fuck, who's setting up their electronics, who's setting up their lights. Mm. You know, they might be electrocuted. Yeah. The sound yeah. might not be good. They have this full rider and one of the tiny bits of their rider was in the dressing room there needs to be a bowl of M&M's with no blue M&M's. Now everyone goes, yeah. oh my God, they're out of control. That's all they want. Actually, it just meant that Van Halen or Lee Roth would walk into the dressing room and if there was a bowl and if they had taken the blue M&M's out, it meant that everything else yes. in their rider had been dealt with. They yeah. probably could trust the sound. They could trust that. Mm. So actually that was an incredibly smart move, mm. but it's also the epitome of being a monster. Yeah. So I'm not saying be a monster in, in just for ridiculous ways. But it's about keep, if you really love what you do, keep fucking obsessive control yeah. over it. Yeah. And I'm sorry, that's not ego. That's not like, oh my God, no one else will find it funny. It's like, I could listen to someone else, but then you've got, a, you just got to go with what you, you trust. Mm. So obsessive about how you want your piece of art to be. Yeah, but otherwise it's not but art. Don't, you don't have to be an arsehole to everybody around. No, that's the point. Yeah. Yeah. Be obsessive about your, your product yeah. But be nice to the people that are helping you do that. Mm. It's really simple. Yeah. I mean, now you're going to get someone go, you're a wanker to me. Probably was. I was in a bad mood. But I'm mm. not. I really, you know, a lot of people that work for me come back and work. Uh, and I, I've been a runner. I've made sandwiches for people in edits. You know, I know when people are being cunts. And yeah. it's normally when they're not talented. Sorry, mm. I'm using that word again. I know, that's all right. It's, it's, it's a bit late to say sorry for it now. Well, I'm sorry, but I it's know, an important yeah. word. Yeah. Because yeah. it, yeah. it sums it up. Like, yeah. You know. Something else I feel like is coming from you, and hey, look, correct me if I'm wrong, but like to be loved, it's like you have to uh, accept the fact that you're going to be hated too. You have to have the courage because you're saying, I don't want anything vanilla. I'm not, I don't want to tweak it and have a committee of seven. And I'm only saying that because I've done that yes, mistake. Exactly. Like, I've made vanilla yeah. and I fucking hate it. Yeah. And I've hated myself for allowing and, and, to do it. And no one really, yeah. And people don't go mad about the vanilla. I guess what was great about Trigger is a lot of people would have thought this is bullshit. You can't do this. This is outrageous. Surely that's good art that, that polarizes people. I don't give a fuck. What it, I honestly don't give a fuck. I'm much more upset when I've made something that I've just thought, oh, do you know what? I took my foot off the pedal there. And sometimes it's because you don't want to be a wanker. Mm. I'm yes. downing it. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> you know, like, yeah. I, um, sometimes it's like you think, oh, my God, I, you know, I've been given all this opportunity and I, I don't want to be rude to all these people that really mm. like what I'm doing. And I actually think, oh, fuck that. Yeah. You've got to keep control of it. You've got to keep your foot on the pedal. And, yeah, I'm more offended by making vanilla stuff mm. than, than not. So... I don't know. I mean, I'm an absolute perfect working example of how not to do your career, <laughs> how not to <laughs> proceed in comedy. But I've made great stuff yeah, and I've made sure. shit stuff. But I, yeah. I know what's right and what's wrong. Sort of yeah. Thing. So you say you're a classic example of how not to, but surely Definitely. because of that, you're surely you give people the courage to question if they're going down a road in their life that they don't want to oh. because you've taken some risks and you've tried some stuff and you've tried to have some fun along the way. Definitely. I, I, I mean, I've failed massively in so many parts of my life. And do you know what? I kind of, probably because I'm an ex-goth. Well, I'm not an ex-goth. You're never an ex-goth. No. I kind of revel in that. I kind of love beautiful failure. Like, mm. I, and, and sometimes my failure has been just because I did something for the money. And that's not beautiful. But sometimes I try to do something so weird. Like when I left Trigger uh, and I went to the BBC, the first thing I did was a, a chat show. And like my whole point, my whole thoughts about people that had a hit and then went to the BBC was they ended up becoming wankers. You know, like you get given a chat show suddenly. Why would I have a chat show? So I thought I'd make a chat show called This Is Dom Jolly. And the whole joke was 
I just was a wanker, mm. out of control. I was playing at what I kind of was worried about being. Yeah. But instead of calling it, this is John Dolly, I just called it, this is Dom Jolly. Mm. And I put glasses on. I just assumed people would know I don't wear glasses. Yeah. So for me and my wife, it was really obvious <laughs> yeah. it wasn't me. So when I made it, the whole point was I wanted 20% of the people to think, oh my God, this guy is a car crash. Mm. And 80% of the people think, oh my God, I know what he's doing. Actually, I think because even though I was in every scene of Trigger Happy, no one really knew who I was. Yeah. I think 80% of people watched it and thought, oh my God, this guy mm. is a massive wanker. Yeah. Now I was totally playing a role there, but it completely backfired. But I loved making that show. Yeah. It was so weird and so fun. So no regrets in that. You did doesn't really matter that the world didn't understand it. Well, there probably are regrets because I'd love to have done more of it. Mm. But I love that we you know, went you for were, something really weird. Have you read about that on Wikipedia? No. Because even Wikipedia don't get it. And they don't really... It, when you read about that on Wikipedia, they're confused about that. Oh, but I wouldn't about read that. that. But no, Wikipedia but, doesn't fucking understand no, it. No, no. I, mean, yeah. I mean, I write most of my Wikipedia, so yeah. I probably haven't understood it. Mm. I, I, who, who knows what that was? Mm. But I had the best fun ever. I had this live show where I had my favourite band. I had The Cure on. They're like, mm. I was a goth. I had The Cure came on. The Cure were in on the joke. So halfway through the, the, the Cure playing a song, I wandered on stage eating a sandwich and asked him these really shit questions, which yeah. you'd never ask Robert Smith. And then I'd get The Cure fan club slagging me off even mm. Robert Smith knew, you know I mean it was it was kind of a bit up its own ass but god I loved it yeah so, and yeah. do you think that that line between trying and risking stuff that ends up failure is also the line that has made the things that you've done well be good oh I don't know and don't answer that yet because I'm just going to finish this okay because that phone's about to die and I don't want him to see it I'm going to get another glass of wine as yeah well. yeah sure let's do it excellent do you want us to, we can go out and get you one no I'll get I'll get one just here. can you go with him Rob Hiya. Oh, sorry, he's just, he's just shouting out there, so. Hello. This will have to have the E on it, won't it? <laughs> oh, they've all disappeared. I'm looking for my glass of wine. Hello. Hiya. Is there any way I can get another glass of wine? Uh, been counting. Really? <laughs> You've been counting? Sorry, I asked for one, but I'm stuck in here. And there's someone following me with a camera, and it's all a bit weird. <laughs> Sorry, crazy. It's not open, so. Uh, it's, it's a large glass of Viognier, I think. I can just reorder You're it. stuck in right? here like it's a prison. I, yeah. It's a prison. I hate it. <laughs> <sighs> I'm talking nonsense now. It's quite fun. As long as you're enjoying it, I'm enjoying it. So. Nothing I like better than talk about myself. <laughs> so, um, do you watch documentaries? You, oh my you God, into that? I'm just obsessed with documentaries. Yeah. I mean, I hate comedy. I'm not mm. into comedy. I'm not into drama. I, all I watch is documentaries. Yeah. I'm totally obsessed mm. with documentaries. So that's something else we have in common. So oh, really? I, I love watching the documentaries on people, yeah. like all walks of life. Yeah. I mean, I, for the last 10 years of my life, what I've been trying to do is study people who are successful and sometimes not in the perceived way just to see what I can learn from get inspired by them and I watched Alexander McQueen documentary oh my god that that isn't that incredible oh, it moved me to tears yeah, and yeah actually I mean I was two days away from being 40 when I watched that and yeah. I watched that literally last week I thought that you, you wanted oh, lovely. Yeah. oh that's all right sorry no no I wasn't that's all right please let's see I'll have a fire <laughs> um that was really weird and actually he was a great example let me shut the door mm. he was a great example of someone Sort of who knew what he wanted to do really early on. Yes. And had no background in it. Mm. Realised he was amazing at it. And in the end got kind of killed by it. Yeah. Like because he got, you know, he was so unhappy because I think other people, when he went to Givenchy or wherever yeah. he went. Yeah, that's an amazing example. It is. Of that. Except yeah. he's different because he, he was someone very, like, clearly talented, mm. knew what he wanted to do. And from not like, he wasn't just given it as a kid. No. That was an amazing documentary. Yeah. yeah. I never yeah. understood it because I kind of, like most people think fashion, what the fuck? Yeah. What are you doing dressing as, a, as an ostrich and stuff? <laughs> but those shows, some they of them were fantastic. Like, that was theatre. That, right? was, that was art. It was art. In yeah. fashion form. I totally agree. Yeah. And it was something taken really in a trivial sense. So in a, in a tiny way, that's the way I look at Trigger Happy. Trigger Happy to me sometimes is art, really. Yeah. Like when we first started doing Trigger and we do these weird scenes. When I say we, it's not a raw we. It's me and Sam who mm. made it. Uh, we'd suddenly, we'd get to a place and start to film it and there'd always be this fucking stencil saying this is not a photo opportunity and it was Banksy. Yeah. Banksy had just started as well. And frankly, like, I mean, I'm, there's no way I'm as good as Banksy, but 
there were things we were doing that was very similar to Banksy. It was just sort of weird, surreal stuff. But Banksy was selling it for 50 million. Mm, yeah. And we were like on Channel 4 and I was like, fuck, I should have gone into art. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But hey, a lot of people are doing similar things to you in their own artistic way and they never got on Channel 4. And yeah, 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 yeah. No, I loved it. I mean, I've had a great life, so mm. can't complain. So the thing I wanted to talk about with the documentary um, was I f- one thing that really stood from me from that, well, there's a lot of things, obviously, but he said... I want people to feel something. I don't want anyone in the middle in my totally shows. I that. want them to love it oh, yeah. or hate it. I'm definitely with and that. There's that, nothing worse than can, sort of don't care. No. Yeah. And, totally and then that, that, you know, like that middle ground, like you said, a vanilla or a no man's land. Vanilla. Yeah. I'm totally with that. And I think maybe that is an important thing. It's the same thing that I feel with music. I'm really into my music. Mm. And, and it's like, I, I either want to fucking hate an album yeah. or love it. Yeah. But the worst thing is to put an album on and then, People start yeah. talking like, yeah. because they're not even listening to it. Yeah. It's like, fuck that. What well, do you yeah. find with the best albums? Like, I'm into bands like Radiohead, Porcupine Tree. I'm into quite a lot of metal. The band, the, the, the albums that you don't quite get first time round, mm, but then the, you go deep into the album and then all of a sudden, wait a minute, where did that song come from that was really good? And then you, you like the first few songs, but then a year later you listen, you like the last three songs, as opposed to... You start it, it's a few chords, it's nice and catchy, and then you're bored of it. Well, I've got two things in music. I mean, firstly, I have a, I think the one difference I have to all my friends that are real music snobs is that I I love music, but I'm not a snob. So Mm. I love that moment when you put a song on it and it just gets you so much. Yeah. You want to hear it again and again. But I can have that with a Kylie Minogue song Mm, as well as a Nick Cave song. I mean, Mm. actually, and they work together, so that works. But you know what I mean? So I'm not a music snob in that way. I don't think it's... I've got friends who... I'll put a song on. I'll say, do you like this? They go, oh, mm. fuck, it's amazing. And then you tell them who it is. And because they're not cool, it's like, oh, fuck that. Yeah. Like, that I hate. Yeah. But there are also things, as you said, that I often think about Desert Island Discs. If I ever uh, did Desert Island Discs, what are the songs that... Because there are songs that... There are those things you just play and play and play and then they go. Yeah. But there are certain ones that still... I remember when I was 18 and I'll still put them on mm. and they're still amazing. So... It's kind of resonance and, but also music's a lot about that it represents what you were doing at that time. To yeah. me, they're markers of things. Well, it stirs your emotion and then the emotion but it creates the memory. it takes you straight back yeah. to something like that. Like if so, you yeah. played Pearl Jam, Jeremy, I will instantly cry being dumped by my girlfriend yeah, yeah, when yeah. I was 15 years yeah. old. Yeah. I mean, I had the Psychedelic Furs who like, they're a band that just remind me of like my parents divorcing and like, mm. but I love them anyway like that. The Cure... Like, they were just totally me growing up. But then I became friends of Robert Smith, which was yeah. fucking insane. And yeah. he ended up in my sitting room at home with me trying to take down pictures of me looking like him <laughs> around the room, yeah. which was like Alan Partridge. And then in the end, four in the morning, he's pissed in my sitting room. And I'm like, I've got to go to work tomorrow. Mm. So I had to kick him out of my own house. So, <laughs> like, I love all that weirdness yeah. about it. And then Bowie, I was obsessed with Bowie, like everyone was. And yeah. I met him once at Geneva Airport. And all my life, I thought, what would I say when I met Bowie? I just, mm. I just became like a gibbering wreck. I think I asked him about his teeth or something. <laughs> I was just like, what are you doing? Mm. Like that. So, yeah. So, I think something that's coming up a lot in this conversation is, or I perceive it, is risk. Um, so, I think great music is when an hour, a, a, you know, a band maybe takes a risk and doesn't play four chords over and over and over. You know, they... I don't think it's risk. I think it's, I think it's about, it's probably why you like the music you like. And I like it. And you only realise it sometimes. In the end, like Nirvana, I never quite knew why I loved Nirvana. And then there was a moment when they did Nirvana Unplug, mm. Unplugged. And uh, there's a song, How Do You Sleep yeah. at Night? And there's just one moment where he kind of does a visceral howl. Mm. And like you think, you can't fake that. Yeah. And he looks straight into the camera. And his eyes, like literally, you can just see straight in. And you're like, fuck, that cliche, you mean it, yeah. man, sort of thing. Mm. And I just think all great stuff comes... Whether it's like your taste or not comes from when it just is something you're not doing it for money. You're not doing it. You're just doing it because this is just what you have yeah. to put out. And mm. that is what's great. And mm. I think less and less you get that because it's more difficult to get signed as a band to do that. It's more difficult to get money to do that. As a comedian, it's more difficult to get shown to do that. You have kids. So therefore, it's like, that's all very well to have your primal scream, but you've got to fucking pay the bills. Yeah. So, yeah, it's about keeping your voice mm. and i think maybe i might be wrong here but like because if i look behind what you've just said i think that's about courage i think that's about courage to do things your way without letting 
external influences get in the way of that. So I, I don't know if you're into Rage Against the Machine, but to well, me, you know, he sung a different way. They played a different way. Tom Morello, very distinct guitar style. And, and you know, that probably was, it was quite courageous to do something like that. Radiohead in Kid A, they said, we're not going to play chorus, verse, chorus, verse. We're going to mess around with that. As soon as they get popular, I want to get unpopular. But in a funny way, I would argue both those things because Radiohead in a way represent something I almost dislike about Britishness is that like pop, you know, supposedly we're all supposed to hate Coldplay, yeah, because they're like Coldplay and they're free trade and Radiohead are totally artistic. To me, there's something, I mean, I went to school with Radiohead, weirdly, anyway. Mm. There's something very, like, self-destructive about being British. Yeah. They're, they're like, oh, my God, we're so popular now. Let's, let's be fucking, unpopular. Let's try and get rid of our fan. We're so embarrassed yeah. by the whole thing. And I get that. And I like But, the but fact that, that makes them who they are. No, no, and I love mm. them. And I love the fact that they want to stay credible yeah. and artistic. But there's also something very brave about being Coldplay, who, yeah. frankly, their first album fucking amazing oh and the Trouble, second one second yeah, all yeah, that good i agree now there are bits of coldplay i don't like now and i hate the whole fair trade and i'm married to gwyneth paltrow but i love a band that have the fucking balls to say you know what we're not going to suddenly go into our fucking acoustic jazz album now yeah we're just going to keep making fucking yeah. music we love so it's that snobbery thing that i yeah i think you're also talking about courage because i agree because i i used to be very much into progressive music metal or rock and a bit of a, 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 um, well, porcupine tree, right? Yeah, um, yeah, a little bit, but that's a bit Early before million. my time. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, so that's three million now. Um, that's where you got to be. Right. If you really don't care about credibility, that's where you got to be. <laughs> I'll have to check them. Honestly, out, Fugazi so. script for Justice Tear. Yeah. Go for it. Okay. Yeah. Um, He's but, not agreeing with me. No, no, no. I, I, no, he's um, not. I am. <laughs> so, I think there's a lot of courage to both not become popular music, but yeah. also to become popular music. So like when Muse got quite popular, it pissed me off a bit because they were very like rock and who they are. But actually, I respect a band who want to fill stadiums and that's what they want to do. And that's where they want to go. And but there's also a thing you're probably like me, that if you're a real music head and you've got a band you love, you kind of want everyone to hear them. Yeah. But then when they get big, you're like, you kind of think, fuck. This was my band. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And suddenly so it's you like, own them. And yeah, now, yeah, yeah, yeah. And suddenly it's like, oh, everyone But that's a paradox, them. isn't it? Of course it is. Yeah. yeah. And if you're the band, you're like, listen, great respect to you for liking us, but we want to sell a fucking yeah. state. Yeah, Which yeah. you can't blame them for. No, and I think not. that takes courage as so well. Like elbow the yeah, same. Yeah. Really into oh, early elbow. elbow. Fuck, I love elbow. Um, yeah. I like all elbow. Yeah. You know what I love about elbow is that when you look at an elbow concert, you look at men that, frankly, in the stadium, and they're doing something like Some Riot, which I think is one of the greatest songs ever written. And it's this sort of northern fat guy basically singing a beautiful song. Yeah. And you just see these people that normally would be punching the shit out of each other a football match. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Weeping at this. And I just yeah. think that is fucking brilliant. Yeah. I love Elvis. Fugitive Moda, Motel, like oh, that song. Yes. That's a piece of art. Of course me. it is. Yeah. A piece of art. I love them. And I love the fact that they're a proper album band in that they were going for ages. You know, yeah. they've grown. They're friends. Well, I got into them in the very first album. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, you got good taste. Mm, thank yeah, you. There you go. Cool. So sure should, should check out Merlin. That, no, I am going to. Honestly, I am going for to. Justice Tier. Yeah, but like I'm, I'm not that experienced as like an interview kind of guy. So it's kind of hard to keep the conversation and That's remember right. Murray and what were they the first three bands and do the questions That's right. That's and right. let you get pissed. And, I'm going to get pissed. Yeah, right, right. Yeah. And you want us to walk around in a minute, don't you? As well. Oh, okay. stagger around. Yeah. <laughs> Um, what, nodding and doing so I'm, I'm trying to dra I'm trying to drag out this theme and I'm not doing it's it very right. well but that's about this risk thing I think what well, I perceive that um, you've been prepared to take some risk and be and being prepared to fail I was all about risk because I didn't see it as risk I was just all about wanting to do I couldn't give a fuck I just wanted to do what I wanted to do yeah and I didn't know whether it was right or wrong but it just made me happy and I'm like a I'm just I'm a sort of uh I'm an instant gratification guy. Like mm. I just wanted to do this and enjoy it. But then the problem is you suddenly make this stuff and you think, fuck, suddenly I made massive amounts of cash and I was yeah. famous. And I was like, fuck. Uh, how I, was that, by the I, way? I, it was awful. Like, oh, right. I mean, now I'd love to go back and kind of appreciate it because I didn't. Anyway, that's way too complex. But the yeah. point is you kind of suddenly think, oh, my God, this has happened. And then you think, oh, I've got to keep this going and stuff. And that takes it all the way so basically failure breeds art that's mm. the that's i think what we're going to i don't know what i'm saying anymore but i just yeah. now i agree yeah. I, th I think that failure or hunger is what you need like you know poverty breeds art failure breeds art cold breeds art if you go to 
any cold country, this is another odd dynamic, but if you go to Iceland, you go to weird towns in Russia, you go to somewhere really grim, it's fucking shit, but mm. there will always be an amazing bar. There'll probably be a great Shh. band. Oh, nice. Just check that's your right, phone. It's waterproof. X, I can afford it. <laughs> Look at that. He's trying to do it. Basically, cold <laughs> fucks you. I don't know what I'm talking about. No, I don't. <laughs> that made me laugh too much. <laughs> right, I'm charging you for that. All right. No it's worries. waterproof. Yeah. But cold does. Like, go to a fucking hot country. I was a goth, yeah? So you have goths in England <laughs> who were like Robert Smith and all like, oh, I'm very you know, unhappy and yeah. eating Baudelaire. Goths in America became Marilyn Manson and actually even the people who did Columbine. But goths in the south of France, you don't get art in the fucking south of France. Yeah. Because what are you going to do? You just go to the beach. You're not yeah. going to sit in your basement and write a great poem or whatever. So I don't know quite what I'm saying here, mm. but if you really want to do some great art, go somewhere cold. Not great advice. But. Do you think that's because it, it, it um, spurs some kind of big emotion in us? Well, no, it's because it makes you insular. It, like, I've got right. a friend who lives in Newfoundland and stuff, and, and I think if you're really... You know, if the if the outside is really hostile and cold and you're having to internalise and you spend all winter in one right, room, yeah. you start to think a lot and you start to write stuff down. Mm. If you're living in the south of France, fuck it, you just go to the beach and yeah. get pissed. Now, you can have a lot of fun, but you end up with Wham Club Tropicana, which mm. is a great song, but it's not art. Yeah, I've never heard anyone say that, but... I know, uh, but it's probably because I'm wrong. No, but I think it's probably because... Um, you're. I think you're a very creative person. Yeah. Do you have, like, creative... Like, yeah, or or ways to get creative. So you like sitting up there writing, but are there ways that you can get into this creative flow? Unfortunately, it's normally this, yeah, which is uh, something very odd. I used to think I used to not be a massive. By the way, for someone listening, this is oh, this wine. is booze. Yeah, yeah. booze can and we drugs. We get a cloth because that that water is just ever so slightly going your way. Okay, for someone listening, that's not my water for a start. No, I just spilled water everywhere. <laughs> Rob has just urinated on the table and it's a way to try and put me off the interview, but I'm totally cool with it. It's like whatever rocks is in his thing. So, so I, I, while we're getting that water, so like mo my, mostly in my podcast, what I'm trying to do is... And what um, are you trying to do? Yeah, I'm trying to reverse engineer what's made successful, interesting, Are you trying to work that out for you, though? People. Or are you trying oh, to genuinely definitely. work it out for someone else? No, no, me. Definitely. Yeah. Like, if I can't get my own benefit out of my own show, why am I doing it? So like, because I've I, got the best seat here. Because the truth, I genuinely think, is that, you, you know, it is interesting what you're doing. And I've thought about this stuff, which is why I like the idea of this show. Mm. But actually, you don't fucking know. And if, and if you but you've got to keep looking, surely. You do. And unfortunately, the real truth is you only ever know after the event. Yeah. Now, maybe you can use that. And I do think that 10,000 hours thing, I keep coming back mm. to. I do think experience. Thanks, Bella. Experience is the, is the thing you learn the most. Yeah. And, and, and it does make you, whether you know it or not, realise, oh, I've done that before and I've made that mistake. And you just instinctively can do things mm. better. But I think that only works if you've dedicated your life to one thing. Yeah. Because that's where that 10,000 hours... But you have to start somewhere, don't you? You have to start of, an hour one. Of course one. you do, yeah. yeah. So I suppose the only real advice I've learned, you know, in 30 years in showbiz or whatever, is is just keep doing it. Yeah. Like, and, and if you can afford to keep doing it and keep going at it, you will get better and better at it. Mm. And, and it's you'll be able to fake it. Though. Yeah, yeah. You know, that's what it comes down mm. to. Mm. So um, I'll... I wanted to talk to you because I felt like I wouldn't get what I get out of a normal interview with someone who's been successful in their art and is reverse engineering success. I was quite scared coming down here. Really? Yeah, because I'm uh, yeah, I'm getting down rough down here. <laughs> yeah, that's, the hood. that's exactly yeah. what it was. Yeah, because I just I knew you'd run <laughs> rings around me. I'm which, not running rings around you, which, I I this no, really which I've really enjoyed. By the I, way, I mean I find it really interesting talking about something that I am the living embodiment of not doing like mm. because i've had a brilliant life like if you told me when i was 18 what i've done to now yeah i would bite your fucking hand off because yeah. i've done all these different things and yet i wake up most mornings thinking Fuck, fucked up what did yeah. i do but that's like in smaller ways because as you succeed in things you're that's the other thing i found really weird you can spend 20 years on 20 grand a year yeah and you're totally happy with it yeah like if you have one year you suddenly get a 40 grand a year Thanks, fucking you get used to that very yeah. quickly yeah. and again that is a real uh stopper to going to thinking oh so i could keep doing shit at 40 grand a year or if i just said fuck off all of you start again it's very difficult to do that to go back so those people that again it comes back to that thing if you've got a comfy job but you've got a great idea and you think i really believe this 
that's it is difficult to like leave mm. your comfort yeah. and like b- follow your beliefs if you've also got family and kids it's not your choice anymore and i keep coming back to that but i think that's a massive thing for people because mm. it's not you know it's difficult enough for you to like go oh i'm taking big risks but you're taking risks for people that are like it's not my choice it's like whether you do it or not and i think yeah. that's a huge thing that i've learned mm. it's like I should have been gay. That's what I've realised. Oh, right. It'd have been and much now, now you've just told everyone. No, but right. that would have been better. Yeah. Because if you're gay, fantastic. I've got no kids. I can just pursue my life absolutely even-handedly. And, you know, or not gay. But like, it's, not, so, it's so easy, though, isn't it, to look at other someone else's life, project out all your fears, insecurities, and what you didn't achieve and assume that they've achieved that. Because, like, you just a couple, few minutes ago said that you, you enjoyed this conversation. I think because if you're able to have a conversation and look at your life, talking to someone who's trying to pick out all the good parts, you probably don't sit up there every day when you're having a glass of wine going, oh, look at all the good parts of my life. No, I you're don't. You're probably looking at all the things that have gone wrong or what you... Do you see what I mean? Well, no, so, I never... I never even... I mean, even the fact that you've got the word entrepreneur in your podcast made me excited because... Like the last thing in the world I am is an entrepreneur. Because like an entrepreneur to me, immediately, it, it's really weird. It's that word. I think you are. You see, it's interesting. I had this very discussion with someone the other day. He said, you are an entrepreneur because yeah. basically you've managed to. You just don't to want to be labeled as No, it? to wing it. By yeah. m- but you've made your own yeah. work. To me, entrepreneur means immediately someone that's got a stable financial right. thing and I do not I'm yeah. so unstable financial I'll go one year I'll make a shitload and I'll spend it and great next minute like right now I'm worrying about fuck where am I going to get my next money yeah. from so an entrepreneur to me to a lot of people that definition is exactly what entrepreneur means I suppose to me an entrepreneur is someone that actually knows what they're doing business wise right. to yeah. me it feels like it's someone that is a business head yeah so I'd love the quiver I'd like a twin brother who was like an accountant yeah, yeah, and a, yeah. like a really dull twin brother. That'd yeah. be my ideal. And we'd be the jolly twins. Yeah. yeah. And I could do and all my have a lot more money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, yeah. But I'd probably have, you know, but I would have a lot more money. Like I've got friends who've done exactly the same as me and they've saved all their money yeah. and they're all like, Oh, look at me. I've bought mm. a little place there. And I know I've got my pension plan and I'm really jealous of that. But on the other hand, they've had a fucking boring life. Yeah. I've had an amazing life mm. and I could be knocked over by a bus tomorrow. Yeah. So, but you, you said that somewhat flippantly. I wish it no, was I'm like not. a... No, in terms of the twin oh, bit. Oh, so not flippantly. Uh, no, no. So not, I should have okay. married an accountant. Yeah, yeah. That's what I read. 100%. Like. Because, <laughs> like the, um, another documentary, if you want to watch, is the, the one on Valentino. Um, oh, I haven't it's seen just that called, It's just called Valentino. Great name. Um, and Thank yeah, you. it's great. And obviously... Well, everyone, everyone, business? Um, he had that? a business partner for 45 years and most people know, don't know who he but is. That's the, he was the moi moi, you know, and he was doing the sketch. He's a massive diva. But that's why it works. That's the secret. And that's why, again, you know, I'm joking. I should have married. You know, I love my wife. I really yeah. do. But she's shit. Like, <laughs> she is as bad at business as I am. Yeah. And I, I should have married. So a you married yourself. You yeah. married a female. Well, no, no, no. We're very different. Like she's very nice. She's Canadian. She's everything I'm not. Right. So she basically, how a bigger cunt I am, and I'm not a cunt. But if when I behave like a cunt, people meet my wife and go, you know what? She's so nice. He can't be that big an arsehole. Yeah. Because she wouldn't have married him. Yeah. And she keeps me grounded. Mm. But oh my god, I should have married a really mm. smart. <laughs> business-minded accountant it would have been mm. brilliant but then i'd probably had a boring life so yeah. you, that i suppose again that comes down to life is what ifs you could always have your different life but the thing is that is your fucking life it's yeah. what you've done mm. and like am i gonna die and think i should have and at the moment no i'm not i yeah. mean there's possibly a bit more drugs possibly a bit more loose sex but apart from that no I'm not. I'm, yeah. I've fucking gone for everything yeah i've never said no pretty much to anything yeah so i can't complain no and what about next? What are, you get, what are you up for doing next in your career? Well, it's difficult because at my age, I'm 50. And again, someone who's into hidden camera or pranks, especially if you call it pranks, there's an age where you can't dress as a squirrel. Is there? Right? Yeah, there is. Could you really, could you bust that? What? That, that, that perception. But it's not even a perception. It's just that there's a level of energy required in just right. fucking going up to people on the street and asking them whether they want to hold a banana or something. It's like, yeah. you know what? And I've never written before, like properly. Mm. I've written books. And so I've just written a sitcom oh, just off the back of my head. I just did it. And it's just been um, optioned by Working Title. And suddenly right. I'm like, fuck, Working Title? Yeah. That's a proper film company for TV though. And I'm like, shit, maybe that is the way I should go. Because for me, I've always been, I've got to riff this stuff. Like I love that riffing. I love the instant joy of like i don't know what i'm gonna say and i've made it up and it's mm. brilliant and actually i thought but i do have a sense of humor and i'm not stupid 
So, and I watch sitcoms and I think they're a dying art form. Yeah. They're shit. They're the same thing every time. And I think, well, maybe I could have a go at it. Mm. So I finally, rather than just slag them off, thought I'll have a go. Yeah. So I wrote one, like a pilot, and that has been optioned. And who knows? So maybe that's the future. Mm. I have no idea. Right. So you're know. okay with that? I don't know what I'm okay with, really, because I'm a <laughs> show off, really. And I like, I've got an ego and I like being in it. So I don't know if I could. So the pitch I've got at the moment is like, I'm, I've written the sitcom and I'll direct it, which I know I could. Mm. And I'll put other younger people in it. And I think I'd be sitting there going, oh, you're fucking shit. Mm. I want to be in it. So I don't know. Yeah. I, I have no idea. I honestly have no idea. I have no plan for this. There's no rule book for this. No. There's no one I can go to and go, if you're an actor, like, I think you could go to an old, you know, you'd be in a film with an older actor and say, you know, and they give you some tips. Mm. Who the fuck does what I do? It's like, you know, I'm yeah. going to meet an older squirrel because, you know, when I was doing prank <laughs> shows back in, uh, back there, you know, this is the mistake. I don't know. There's no one I can no. guide off, but I kind of like that. Mm. So I don't know. Mm. I just, I'd like to live another 35 years. I'd like to be healthy. I'd like to be able to take copious amount of drugs and drink without affecting anything. Mm. And I'd like to... Is that being a part of your art? What? Drink and drugs. Oh, very much so. Yeah. yeah. All great artists drink and yeah. drugs. I mean, name me a song that hasn't been written on drinking drugs, mm. and I'll name you a John Denver song, and it's shit. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's weird. I started off, I wasn't a big drinker at all when I started doing Trigger. I certainly never tried drugs, but I've done everything now. And uh, I don't know if it helps or not. It just keeps you alive, doesn't it? It's just different mm. shit. I don't know. There, I mean, certainly you can, you can start drinking so much that you think, well, oh, fuck, that's good, and it's not. I don't know. It's just everything in moderation. Yeah. But also everything in extreme. Mm. Yeah, I said that. <laughs> <laughs> Media. You re- you talked about TV. You know, in six years it's going to be different. It's all going to be well, player type. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm being polite. I mean, yeah. telly is dead. I mean, my kids. When I even when I brought back Trigger Happy, I was never going to bring back Trigger. But then I thought, fuck it. I've got all these new ideas for Trigger. Why shouldn't I do it? And I was going to get a Channel Four and say, let's do it. And then I look at my kids, and my kids don't watch. You know, my kids fourteen, and at the time they were twelve and sixteen. Oh. My kids never watch fucking telly. Yeah. So even if Trigger came back and it was a massive hit, they'd never watch it. Mm. They're all on their screen. So I thought, right, you've got to do something that's probably what I'd done in the first time with Trigger. You just do something that exists as a commodity and then you sell it to Netflix or you sell it to, you know, YouTube, you put yeah. it on YouTube or wherever it is. You still so get royalties and all that for that? For Trigger? Yeah. Oh, yeah. We yeah, sold yeah. it to like 80 countries around the world. Oh, yeah. right. It was amazing. So essentially you've created an asset. Well, I created a tiny asset because, unfortunately, it was the very first thing I ever did. So I think I had 6% of Trigger, which is quite a good deal. Right. But it's annoyed me for 20 years. Yeah. I mean, Trigger sold 3 million DVDs. That's 20 million, 20 quid a DVD. So that's 60 million. I mean, basically, I'm like, I'm very chuffed with the money I made from it. But some, I put my fucking life and soul into that for three years. 6%. And I'm like, someone... Yeah. Who the fuck are the 94%? Because <laughs> yeah. I've never met these wankers. <laughs> and, and they did fuck all. I'm sorry, you know you did fuck all. So. <laughs> you looked right out of there, didn't you? Well, not him. It wasn't his fault. Yeah. Well, it might be. Yeah. Maybe, maybe it is. But you know who you are, you fuckers. You know, you've got hands and How would you, you do it differently now? Well, I wouldn't do it differently now. No, because, I mean, in terms of the owning the asset and the business side of it. Well, I mean, if I knew what I was doing, you know, in if I'd really been knowing what I was doing, I would not have... I would have literally... Uh, I'd have probably got a loan and got some yeah, at the time. If somehow I'd have got a loan, more of your asset. I'd have got someone to pay for me to make Trigger, and I would have owned it, mm. which is what I do now. Like now with our production company, we basically normally make our own stuff because you've got you've got uh, faith in it, and then you sell it to people. Yeah. But at the time, who the fuck knew who I was? I didn't know that Trigger was going to be good. I was like, fuck, someone's paying me to do this shit. I had an office. I had a brilliant time. It was great. But it does like in the in when you start looking back at it, you think, well, hang on. But actually, that's even my deal was quite a good deal compared to most people. So. Mm. I mean, that's business. It's yeah. shit, you know. But. Mm. And um, your books. Yeah. Uh, is that like... Nobody a, reads books watching this, but books are... Books are a big renaissance at the things. moment. They are weird. Yeah. Really. yeah. Books are huge. It's yeah. weird. My books have actually done very well, but I have... Again, it's part of my jack-of-all-trades thing. Literally... Uh, the people who love Trigger Happy would never read my... This is a very... There's a tiny Venn diagram in which they do. Mm. But generally, most people that watch Trigger Happy would never read my books. And most people that really like my books have never heard of Trigger Happy. Yeah. And that's nice in some ways. 
But in other ways, it's like the worst commercial decision. I, mm. You know, ideally, I should write Trigger Happy the book, and it would work and stuff. Yeah, but I love my books. Mm. All I ever wanted to do was travel when I was a kid. When I grew up, I read Tintin. I had a map in my room, and everywhere Tintin had been, I wanted to go to. And I've now been to every place that Tintin's been to. Right. And that's all I wanted to be. And then growing up in Lebanon, foreign correspondents were kind of cool, and they looked like... And that's all I wanted to be. So my books are really me being a shit foreign correspondent. Mm. It's like foreign correspondents go in when the war's just about finishing. I'm going in 20 years after the war's finished and writing about it. But I just like going to places that are weird. Mm. And if you could pick one that you you think people who are watching and listening might like to start with, what one would that be? Well, depending when this is going out, my new book, uh, which I'm writing upstairs, The Hezbollah Hiking... Well, if you tell us, we'll we'll schedule it. Uh, May the 26th, my new book, The Hezbollah Hiking Club, comes out. And I basically walked. I grew up in Lebanon, but never really knew Lebanon that well. And there is a walking trail in Lebanon, which is the world's most underused tourist attraction. Yeah. So I, I walked from the Israeli border to the Syrian border across the top of Lebanon. It took me 26 wow. days. Yeah. But if you really want an entry level to my books, yeah. the best thing I've ever done is a book called The Dark Tourist. Okay. And The Dark Tourist, I nicked off this book I loved in the 80s by a guy called PJ O'Rourke, who had the best job in the world. He was Rolling Stone's foreign correspondent. Mm. And he wrote a book called Holidays in Hell. And he just went off to Korea when it was when there were riots, he went to El Salvador, he went to Lebanon. He just went off and tried to have a holiday in, yeah. in danger zones. And I did the same thing. I, went to the, uh, I wrote a book called The Dark Tourist. I went to North Korea on a two-week holiday. I went skiing in Iran. I went to Chernobyl for the weekend. I went to Cambodia and went to a war crimes tribunal. Wow. Um, I went on an assassination vacation around America where I just went to all the assassination sites. That's uh, it. Generally, wasn't, and it's just you reporting on that. It's not it? reporting. It's just generally that's that I love like, that sort of travelling. Yeah, and I, so it's about me just doing that. Mm. So actually, I think what I love is I think you learn a lot from it. Yes, but I'm not trying to teach you anything. I'm genuinely having a good time, and I yeah. just go and just do it. Yeah. Mm. So that's my favourite book, Dark Tourist. Go and right. buy it. It's genuinely good. Mm. And if you can't read, which a lot of you can't because you're listening to this, there is an audio book. Good. I read all my audio books as well. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. So um, you said earlier, and we, we got off on a bit of a tangent, which was fine. It's like, We've you know, do you? Yeah, we, we have. I'm <laughs> Just wait till my third glad, glass of wine. Glad you said that. So you said, you know, do you do this for yourself? Of course, I do this for all the listeners, because if they don't get anything out of this, then it's too much of a selfish act. Yeah, but fuck but I do If you do were this, doing this and you were bored, no, that would come across. 100%. You know, I yeah. do. I, I, it's I, coming across now, I, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit. But 100% do this for myself as well. I think if you do the art that you do for yourself and not just for a market, I think that's important. But I don't even call it art because it's just life, isn't it? I mean, mm. I mean, I think it's for someone else to call something art, you know, because I kind of, you know, there's parts of me, my egotistical side, I think parts of Trigger Happy is art. Yeah. But I think it's, I'd be a wanker to call it that, but I am. But you just uh, did. <laughs> I know, I know. That's my clever, defined way of doing it. But, um, but I just think really it's about, can I just, can I earn my living doing something I genuinely fucking love. Yeah. And I think if you can do that, you're happy. Mm. And actually that comes across like, yeah. because what's, what's not, because that's what like? we're buying from people. Aren't we? When we buy music, we're buying their emotion that we can feel, you know, when you're buying book, you're buying someone's life or journey that they've put, put in a way that we can feel. Yeah. But so it's different, isn't it? Cause this isn't feeling. That's what I always feel. Maybe it's my difference. It's like a book. I get that. If someone writes beautifully, it's really nice music. Like, you don't really know what that person is, but it just gets you, doesn't it? Mm. Like someone could be Cambodian and write a great music song and you don't understand what they're singing about. But if it's great, I'll be honest with you, I haven't had that Cambodian experience. But there was actually, well, anyway, in my book, there was a very weird Cambodian heavy metal scene, mm. which was one of the weirdest things I found when I went to Phnom Penh. Between 1971 and 75, there was this really hardcore Cambodian heavy metal scene that literally went on to influence People like Fugazi and wow. but that's so obscure. But yeah. yeah. Mm. But that's different from us just chatting. I mm. mean, really, we're just having a pub chat. Mm. So I don't know if that moves people. But what I like is I'd like some kid or some youth watching this and thinking, Oh, I don't want to do it. and then thinking, Fuck, I thought you had to know what you wanted to do before you did it. And that's what I really like about this sort of and thing. And that's not like, therefore this is not just a pub chat. Therefore no, you've not. made someone feel something. I suppose it is feel. I, mm. I suppose I'm feeling emotional rather than actually practically moving. Like for yeah. me, I used to get really bad panic attacks when I was a kid. And I used to think, oh my God, I won't be able to do anything because of panic attacks. And there was a band called The The who I loved and they had an album called Infected that I was incess- obsessed with. 
And just as I was listening to that album, I was getting these terrible panic attacks. I thought, oh my God, I'm never going to be able to do anything because of these panic attacks. And he wrote in sounds at the time, he was having these terrible panic attacks. And I remember thinking, oh my God, if this guy can make this album that I love so much and he has the same thing, fuck it, I can do it. Yeah. And that's what I love about this sort of chat. It's mm. like, there is no mystery to no. being successful or not being successful. A lot of it is luck. A lot of it is just going with it, but just, yeah. just do it. Yeah. A lot of people think, oh, I can't be bothered. Well, you, if you definitely can even make be it bothered. Just, yeah. That's it. You definitely make it okay, I think. Like, oh, someone made it okay for you to have a panic attack or at least to f not feel that you're weird and it's wrong. Yeah. You make it okay for people not to necessarily know what they're going to do with their whole Trust life. Trust me, I'm the uh, poster child. <laughs> yeah. I am the poster child, an ugly poster child for having no idea what the fuck it is you want But to still be. doing great things. And but because people offer it still. I mean, I'm lucky. I had a big hit and that still resonates, you know, so mm. people still allow me to do it. But I mean, I've just... I, I'm in Rocky Horror. I'm in a fucking musical. Mm. How the hell did that happen? Yeah. So. Yeah, that's exciting. And do you, you're you okay with how the world perceives your best piece of work to be Trigger, you know, 20 years ago? You see, isn't that weird? Because, again, if someone told me 25 years ago, uh, you will be known in, like, a lot of the world for, like, this thing, mm. I'd be like, oh, my God, that's amazing. Yeah. But now, obviously, there's a part of me, you know, where even in the 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 program for Rocky Horror goes best known for Trigger Happy TV. I'm like, but I've done so much yeah. stuff since. And you think, well, that's just ego, really. I mean, I'm lucky to have one thing that people know. Mm. And uh, unfortunately, my sort of catchphrase is hello. And I still, if I walk out from here, someone will scream at me, hello. And I'm like, hello. I still don't have a good answer to it. Mm. So yeah, there's a part of me constantly wants to be like, but have you not seen my recent work? It's incredible. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? I'm, I'm lucky to fucking do anything. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yeah, great. Yeah, so, that really annoy me. Sorry? <laughs> no, I'm joking. Sorry. I, don't, um, I always ask the same questions at the end of the interview, and I, I'm looking at these going, these are shit questions. Excellent. Let's do um, shit but questions. actually, they often get good answers. Let's see about so, that. So, um, best advice you ever got? Oh, shit. Right. We're, apparently, we're walking outside. Is that right? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Um, out there, yeah. Yeah, should we sit here? Yeah. Okay. So best advice you ever received? Best advice mm. I ever received? Actually, it was my dad, who was a twat, but he gave me a really good advice, which was, I wanted to be, because I spoke some languages when I grew up, I wanted to be an interpreter. And he said, don't be an interpreter, be the person who is interpreted. Mm. Which is a bit wanky, really. But also, actually, that's also very profound. Kind of is, yeah. Also, don't be a cunt. Yeah, is another one. That's a good one. But that's should we st we should edit this and start with that? <laughs> yeah. What's the worst advice you ever received? Um, I think the worst, yeah, actually the worst advice I ever received was be a team player, be a collegiate player. And I think people see team player, I mean, be a team player means, to me, it means don't be an asshole to the people that are working beneath you or are helping you, which I totally agree with. But I think a lot of people take team player to be, don't like go with what you think, like take everyone's advice. That's the worst advice you can mm. do. You've got to just... Whether you, you know that you're bluffing or you've got no idea, your only hope in most, it's certainly in art, not that I'm in art, but it's like, just, just go with what you think. No, you just don't second guess. Just mm. believe what you're doing. Yeah, great. Um, is there anything in the world that you think is really wrong that you want to change? I think the world's perfect at the moment. Obviously, I'd like, to, uh, I'd like Trump to be eradicated, but not eradicated in any physical sense because I'd never get into America. I think he's a brilliant man. I just like him to be removed from uh, bullying. I hate bullying. I just hate. Uh... Okay, a genuine answer. To that. What do I think is wrong with the world? Is there anything you sort of feel like you stand for? Yeah, I do. I stand for anti-bullying. I think mm. that's what I really can't bear. I cannot believe that. Yeah, well, it's such a complex one. I don't know because um, all these things I do. Uh, I don't bully, but I'm just trying to think what my best one would be. Yeah, okay. I think I just stand for suck it up. It's like people are different. Like, why, why are you so... What really irritates me about the world is like, say you're a devout Christian. Say you're a devout racist. Like, whatever. Why do you need other... Well, say you're a vegetarian. Like, great, I'm really happy you're a vegetarian. But why do I need to be a vegetarian to make you happy? Mm. That's what I don't get. 
I'm really, I personally don't believe in anything too strongly. Mm. But if you believe in something, I'm really thrilled for you, whether it's right or wrong. But if I believed in something, and like, say I thought that Labrador dogs were the future of the world and were the new messiah, mm. I think I'd be very happy that I knew that. Yeah. I wouldn't feel the need to come down into Cheltenham and tell everyone and force everyone to worship Labrador dogs. It's like, mm. look, whatever your belief, whatever makes you happy, I'm really happy for you, but keep it to yourself. Yeah. Don't be a missionary. Mm. Yeah, love that. I don't know what that means. <laughs> this podcast called The Disruptive Entrepreneur. Is it? Doesn't yeah. What it yeah. Was. yeah. Uh, not the realistic entrepreneur. <laughs> so that word, what does that mean to you, disruptive? Disruptive means disrupt, like fuck things up, like have a go, don't go with the flow. And I'm sort of not like that because I'm a confused disruptor because I'm actually quite conservative with a small c. I'm actually quite establishment. I quite like things being stable. I quite like the way things run, but I hate injustice. I hate bullies. I hate people who kind of force their views on other people. So disruptive to me means don't go with the norm. Like mm. just, there, there is no norm. What the fuck does norm mean? And if something becomes norm, it normally means that a lot of people like it, so probably it's a bit boring and it's just like a, everyone's gone for it. So just mm. do what you want, man. Yeah. That was a terrible No, it was great. No, it was great. It really, really I loved wasn't. it. No, it wasn't. That first sentence, we yeah. could definitely pick just that out. No, no, all the rest of oh, no, no, we're not cutting any of it out. <laughs> no, 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 not it. cutting any of it out. Yeah. Um, actually, just quickly before we finish, and I want everyone to sort of follow what you want them to follow. Um, podcasts have obviously got Follow me. Jesus. Don't give him all the followers. You, you, we, we all need some. <laughs> um, podcasts at the moment have obviously take a bit of a renaissance. Yeah, um, a bit we, of a renaissance. We will yeah. not be editing this at all. Wait, you? Um, no. You're serious? Yeah, serious. What? No. Everyone who Seriously? follows us seem to like the raw, all the things what? that I fuck up. Oh, no, you tell me. No, no, no. You're going to watch the whole hey, thing. Yeah, I mean, if you want us to... I've so much shit. Yeah, but if you want us to take stuff out... Yes, we all of it. All of it, yeah. <laughs> yeah. What? Um, no. Are you this, seriously not on the um, it. Well, definitely not the audio. The audio will just be raw, unedited. Right. Yeah, I because um, that. one... That's uh, another thing to... Like, if you're being a disruptive entrepreneur and you agree to do things, read the contract, have some wanker come in. And just, <laughs> like, have someone on your side. I mean, there are four people here. I've got no one on my side. You need someone to come in and go, no, you can't ask Mr. Jolly that because... Ah, oh, fuck, I fucked up again. No, no, no. I think I said I wanted to be gay and was on drugs. Oh, actually, that'd be great. Yeah. That, uh, okay, so um, if I want you to feel like if there's anything you really want us to take out, we'll take out all of it. Okay, fine, we'll take out all of I it don't except start none again. of it. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, definitely, there's a big wave I'm finding in the world a of people a tsunami of people who want raw and edited content. Well, they've they're certainly got that. Yeah, yeah. They have. If you want but to listen sick to of some the, sick of the fake news, swat, talk a lot of shit for two hours. And this is your podcast. Right. <laughs> and there's your trailer. <laughs> but uh, don't you think people are sick of fake news, of everything edited, everything sound... I hate, that word, sound, news, well, I mean, I hate that's you even use that word fake yeah, news. Yeah, but I use it because they use it. I yes, don't use but it they're using it gives it legitimacy because fake news is not fake news. No, it's, it's Fake lies. news means things I don't agree with. And that's yeah. bollocks. Yeah. So there is a lot of propaganda, but it's not that. Mm. But I, I agree with you. What I hate is when things are edited. And again, it's a bit like, again, if you edit something... You I will, could make you look a way yeah, that you don't want you, to look. Oh, you could make me look like a total wanker, which would be very easy edit. <laughs> or a harder edit would be if I was involved and it make me look charming yeah. and really thoughtful. But either way, you'd get totally different views. Yeah. So I agree. I mean, I'm personally all for just listen to me rantle on. And if mm. the last four people listening to this would have their own <laughs> opinion about it. No, so I agree with that. That's not fake news. I mean, that's just reality of... Sure how you have to fit something in. But that's what I love about podcasts is like you can just let it go. Mm. You know? and, and more honesty, I think. What you could do is have a full unedited version of this yeah. and then you could have two shortened versions for people with busy lives. Mm. Dom Jolly the Cunt <laughs> and Dom Jolly Philosopher. The, yes. Which would be a very short one yeah. as well. But yeah. you know, yeah. Maybe we'll do that. Yeah, I don't yeah. think that's going to happen, no. is it, by the way he looked at me? I think you're the first person in 330 ep episodes. My mum's a some... massive cunt. No, no, that said the word. My, my mum listens to this, so I haven't said the word. What word? Um, the C word. The one. Genius. Yeah. You're trying to get me to say it, aren't you? I don't know what word you mean. The C word. See you, see you next Tuesday. Oh, please. <laughs> How old are you? 
40. Yeah, you can't do it. Oh, God. I've never, it's been 40. Even my mum like, <laughs> is happy to use the word cunt. It's a fucking word like anything mm. else. If yeah. you use it negatively as, a, as in a sort of aggressive insult to women, then you're an idiot. Yeah. But it's like, it's just, it, Chaucer used it. And if Chaucer mm. used it, I think I can. Yeah, that's yeah. a good one. Even though Chaucer was a bit dull, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> and we'll end on that. Where can people follow you? Where would you like them to um, track your art, your progress, that you're, the things you're doing? You mean... Do you like do social stalkers media? Or? Yeah, stalkers. <laughs> plenty of stalkers. Do you do social media? Do you want, do, uh, have you got a podcast coming out? I know you talked about your books. Okay. Oh, All I'm that. plugging them. Yeah, yeah. All right. <clears throat> All right. So I have... Uh, I've got a... Blah, blah, blah. I've made a very good podcast called Earworm, which I think you'll really like. And there's a new series I'm about to make. And you can find that on Spotify and all the usual places that... What does yours go out on? iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, yeah. Acast? Um, don't know. Harry, Harry, Harry don't know. know. Yeah. yeah, he's nodding. Anyway, so. go for Dom Jolly's Earworm. It's yeah. Earworm. You'll like that. I've got a book coming out called The Hezbollah Hiking Club uh, on May the 26th. And apart from that, I'm on social media if you want to insult me because everyone else seems to do on it. And is that your name, Dom Jolly? Just on Twitter, I'm Dom Jolly. On Instagram, I'm the real Dom Jolly, which I'm not sure why, because there isn't a fake Dom Jolly. But Instagram <laughs> won't verify me, so it's all very complicated. Mm. And then on Facebook, oh, I guess very complicated. I've got a fan page or whatever. You'll find me, it's fine. But it's one mm. L. Mm. Yeah. One thing you said earlier, actually, just quickly before we finish just is... one thing. That's yeah, I know. Talking. Sorry, sorry. But you, you said you stay here most of the day anyway. Is that... Not I'm, I'm here every day when I'm in Cheltenham, because yeah. otherwise I'm at home and I'm walking my dogs or taking my pigs around and stuff. Mm. So yeah, this is my office. Mm. So you said quite staunchly, I read all my audio books. Like... Oh yeah, of course. Like... Well, no, more Like importantly. if someone doesn't, it's bad. No, actually, rewind. What's incredible is I get people going, did you actually write your books? And, I, and there is a vast amount of people that don't write their own books. And yeah. I'm like, what wow. the fuck is that? Yeah. About? So of course I write my own books. Mm. But I suppose if you've got a really awkward voice or you've got Tourette's, it might be not great to mm. narrate your own book. But it's a lot of time, isn't it? No, it's not. It takes yeah. me a day to read one it of took me books. a week to do one of what? mine. It's not How long are your books? Uh, you one, one, of them, one of them was 155,000 words. What? Well, that then took then me you, a week. That's then a I'm way. just the idiot. Who the fuck would <laughs> read that book? That's wait. 155,000 words? Yeah. Really? Yeah. Mine are 90,000. I suppose it's not too it's bad. Not, that's not, a long yeah. book, though. Yeah, but I've, I think I've, you could have done that down. I've got to read You need an editor, yeah. Yeah. I mean, my worst thing is when I'm reading my own book for Audible, for instance, I normally do it, I'm like, oh my God, I need to change that. So I start but it's too late, isn't I it? Yeah. Doing, yeah. I start editing my book yeah. while I'm reading it, and then, yeah, I get in trouble. But yeah, mm. no, no, my, my, it's all right, you know. Mm. The worst thing is that when I write, I can write accents because I travel. Yeah. So I do lots of funny foreign accents. And when I write them, I think they sound good. But then when I read them... I suddenly sound like a 1970s race, which is terrible. <laughs> yeah. So I, I can't win. They yeah. really only take you a day to do? No, two days, yeah. I'll be fair, because my voice goes after a bit. But 90,000 yeah. words, which is a normal book, not your long... But you must be better at reading book. them than me then, because I just I mess it up a lot. Well, I'm very good at reading, but I'm also reading my own words. Mm. So, like, so I, might, I mess it week? up. Yeah. What I mean, was even, book, even my, That's called like, money. Money? Yeah. 155,000 words. Well, I mean, it's not a small subject, is it, money? I mean, if I write, like, a quick... No, it's so, travelling the world. No, true. Is it a good book? Yeah, it's doing all right. Is it always oh, doing all right? Yeah. Look at that. I don't, I, it? I'm getting judged here now. <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 no. Right. I'm getting interviewed. This is just a long plug for our audiobooks. Look, you, you listen to his book and... And yours. Oh, right, you didn't even do that. Look at that. Yeah. I, I think most people who follow me already... There you go. Yeah. Um, Dom. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was great. Pleasure. Welcome to Cheltenham. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed that. Was that. but yeah. No, well, I thought it was great. Drunken gibberish. Yeah, thank good. you. That's all right. Yeah. All right. You got what you want? Yeah.